So who are we going to start with? And for this video, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to pick an opening, and we've got no internet on here, so this is just going to be a uh, from memory type situation. And I'm going to start with a D4 opening, and then in this video, and then we're going to go to a E4 opening in the next one and just kind of break it down. And hopefully I'm going to provide to you some ideas that will will help with you guys against the Dutch in this uh, in this video. So I've got a few Dutch players and I've got a number of people who play against the Dutch obviously because of the Dutch players in the room. So I'm going to give you a few different ideas that are, are interesting. I'm going to explain for the middle game what both sides are looking for and why some of the lines that I'll throw to you as options for future study could be a good idea. Because my, my philosophy with, with openings, there are certain openings and certain structures that you're going for something very specific. If you're able to avoid that something specific, then typically, like, you're good to go. I'll give you a, a for instance. So, in, and I'll use the, the pure move order, with the Grand Prix Sicilian, like, this stuff was pretty good. You're supposed to sack here. You can take either way. And I'm just going to deviate from my line that's in opening oddities, and I'm going to help you understand the point. So white will build up this attack, where it's pretty clear what white's doing. He, I mean, he's, he's looking to maul you. We see the collection of pieces and the aggression. And in nearly all the lines of the Grand Prix with a bishop on c4, this is this queen e1, queen h4 idea is the plan. It's almost automatic. That's when these guys learn the position, they try to make the one size fits all approach work. When you want to learn openings at a very, very deep and very high level of play, Imagine, because most of you guys are past the rating to where now you have a repertoire with your openings. I would say the players that are sub 500 in USCF rating, they will try to make one thing work in all cases no matter what. So imagine the uh, four move checkmate guy. Okay? <laughs> it, you know what I'm saying? What about going one step further from the four move checkmate guy and with white, it's e4, knight f3, bishop c4. Or e4, bishop c4. We know against e5 that works. But against the Sicilian, French, and Karo Khan, the bishop gets kicked around and you lose a tempo out of the opening and you're already equal if not worse. So one size fits all approach can be a good way to start just so you make it out of the opening. But when you want to get to the next level, Here's the next level. I understand what White's plan is, what he wants to go for in this position with the queen e1, queen h4 stuff. So I'm like, is there any way that when I'm playing against a lower rated guy, I can make him think in the opening? That's what I started asking. So let me roll back to a key moment, and I'll show you the preparation that I put in opening oddities. I played h6 here. And it's like, well, why? And you wouldn't consider h6 when you're looking in the database because there's not that many games unless you understand the point that's coming, the memory marker. If you understand the marker, you're good to go because the structure's easy. So he starts going with the queen e1 stuff. Then I'm going to go b6. And he comes over here on either square. I go g5. My king is not over there to be attacked. I mean, in this case, I probably messed up the move order because h4 looks all right. But can we understand the point overall that I took his plan, and I mean, now I can just put a knight there, bishop on b7, and et cetera, et cetera, and you got a solid game. 
So that was a premise of where I would like to start with understanding what you're going for. Key memory markers in your openings. You need to be able, and this, this is how I train with my openings. When I look at a line, like I know personally right now, one line that I really need to like hardcore study is playing against the Queen's Gambit decline to Rosh. Because I just hate playing against that opening. Like, it's dry, it's boring to me, I feel like I always get an advantage, but I feel like I should just be absolutely crushing my opponent when they play it against me. So, I want to go back in and find, like, the perfect line for me, and in order to do that, I need to understand all the lines and get it really deep, and go backwards from there. So, we're going to start from the black side, and let's look at a specific Dutch. And we're going to go to the general move order. Most Dutches deal with a Fianchetto. And we're going to talk about the stone wall. And bishop e7 versus bishop d6. Bishop d6 is more accurate because it's aggressively placed towards the king side. Now, I lost a lot of games when I was under 2,000 because I didn't face the stone wall very often. It's a rare opening. Pretty easy to understand. When you don't face something, you don't take the time to learn it. So I didn't understand it for white, and I would just make moves. So okay, knight c3, that looks natural enough. All right, well, I need to get my bishop developed, I guess. So I'm gonna go ahead and do this. And black starts doing stuff, okay. And there's multiple plans here where I can go b6, bishop b7. Or you can do the zigzag, bishop d7, bishop e8, bishop h5, in order to get the bishop out. Then you play knight d7. And then there's like some queen e7, and you chill. You can even go aggressive with g5, g4. So see, there's a lot of different plans, but all of black's plans are organized towards making a kingside attack. Everybody seeing this type of stuff, as we pointed out? I mean, the b6, bishop b7, followed by c5, that's a positional plan, but all the other plans are going to be dealing with just, like, trying to maul the guy on the king side. Unless white's just trading down, but, I mean, that's not going to help anything. That just helps me develop easier. Okay? So white just developed, but there's no emphasis or oomph when it, with his play. You need to understand the key memory marker in the position. If this bishop is dead, the good, strong bishop that is pointing towards our king side, if it is dead, we're safe with white. His other bishop is trash. So, I think back to, like, the Grandmaster Repertoire series. Like, it's a position just like this, and then, let's say knight bd7 happens. A rook liked to recommend like this queen c1 idea to go bishop a3 to trade off the bad bishop for the good bishop. Or leave him. Bad bishop, good bishop. So then you go queen e7 to stop it. And I mean, then you can go like a4 or something to make it work. So, why waste all these moves though when I can come back and I get to this position... And now let's, let's talk about it from White's perspective. And I can go bishop f4 immediately. And people go, well, oh, double pawns. Well, he can't ever play e5. He doesn't want to play c5. And I'm going to go e3, king h1, rook g1, and just kind of play chess. I can put my knight on e5, and his knight can be kicked out of the e or g squares at a certain point, so I can just play f3. If you understand that white is not in danger at all and black can't attack you, you understand the position. All you need to know is to trade off the dark square bishop. And it's like, GG. So let me change up the move order a little bit. I'll say, okay, I like this line against the stone wall. And this is playing from an English move order. So let me see if you guys can identify what's different. Have I touched my d-pawn? When I go d3, the guy's not seeing what I'm doing. And this is not the best move order for black. I've already broken the wall, and white wins the majority of the games in the database here. 
So the structurally oriented guy is just doing the same thing over and over and not understanding what the plan is that he's going for. If you do not understand what the memory marker or plan is when you get to the end of your opening, you do not understand that opening line. So you can memorize something all day long, but as soon as you get to the end of it and you're like, mm, A4, that's not going to do it for you. And here, I've had a few tournament games from this position and just like kind of murder my opponent. There's nothing to it. You know, you get this type of stuff and the pawns are permanently weak and you just bother them forever. Yeah, it's easy. The best move order for black there as a reference is to not move the bishop first but to go c6 so on d3 you have bishop c5 because if i play e4 i'm able to trade and trade queens and that makes a significant difference in the position that's why understanding this you go queen c2 to not allow the trade of queens and you can't play knight c3 in this line because you'll go d4 so you go knight d2 and you play e4 and break the wall anyway so I'm either breaking the wall or breaking the wall because I understand the position. So I do not believe the Stonewall Dutches is the best against an English move order. But it's understanding if you're a Stonewall Dutch player, you need to understand, I can't play bishop d6 in every variation, so I need to know to play bishop c5 against this one to get a playable game. And I believe in my notes there's a game by uh, Grandmaster of Rook where he played white in a position very similar to this. So if you're interested for future study there, you can take a look at that. So to get more specific to the players in the room, we understand what one Dutch type of player is going for with the stone wall. So, and we had this in one of the London system series, that this is gonna get your classical Dutch player as well as the Stonewall Dutch with this move order. So after e6, what's going on here for my London players and, and why would it, what would you do here and why? Because there's multiple approaches. And a lot of people only consider, well, I, I learned the London structure. I'm just going to put my pieces on these squares and that's it. I'm not thinking. That's how you started learning it. But then you now know a lot more theory because you're like you now know middle game plans that's the next level uh-huh bishop okay bishop e2 is flexible here and with the idea of potentially h3 g4 and that's in a very very aggressive plan another benefit of bishop e2 is that if they go for b6 you can put that bishop f3 in between, and it kind of forces his hand to make a move that he didn't want to have to move in the position. A lot of people don't think here, and they'll just play knight f3. Uh-huh. Do you think queen f3 would be pretty good? If he goes b6 immediately, it, queen f3 could be considered for the same kind of reason as the bishop e2, bishop f3 idea is considered. Um, so... There is absolutely nothing wrong with this type of position. And, yeah, it, it doesn't put any pressure on your opponent. That's why, like, when we were looking at this type of stuff, when you play h3 and then bishop e2 and then the guy castles, I'm already, like, this just feels, if I'm playing black, I, I'm a little bit uncomfortable, especially if a lower-rated player is doing this type of stuff with white and they're playing quick and confident. It's not necessarily a memory marker like in the other positions, but the point is, do not get in the habit when you learn a structure of just doing the same thing over and over and expecting that, well, this works in all cases every time, period. No. Like when I say when in doubt, hedgehog it out, Ben was like, got it. <laughs> but it doesn't work versus the Alpins. And Ben learned that after about 200 games. No. <laughs> That's right. You didn't learn. Got it. No, I didn't play games. <laughs> you played like 20 games, but, you know. It, it, okay, we'll, we'll settle. We'll settle on 15. He, yeah, ben, ben won 16 out of 15 games. That's, that's the current discussion.
Okay. Yeah. Right. So. So we got some ideas. Well, that was with a London. Say you're a London player move order. But there's some really interesting lines based off this G4 idea. What if we just do it immediately? And to the solid players in the room, like, the look on his face right then, he's like, <laughs> like, like you just had a warhead and you were expecting chocolate, you know. Uh, I like warheads too, but I mean, he wasn't expecting it. He wanted some Hershey's. <laughs> so, all right. I know you know what to do because I played this against you before. And I mean, I remember playing it against you, so. Okay. Do you know? All right, well, let's, let's see what you do and see how it works out, and then we'll go from there. Because now you'll remember it after this lesson. And that's the point in doing this. I would rather you be wrong when I'm calling you out in class in your repertoire in a video lesson because it makes it instructive. Then you go into a tournament game and getting crushed by somebody who does this, and you come out of the room like, <laughs> I don't even know what happened. He just played G4 on move two, and I cried. <laughs> I flipped it around for your perspective. Um, you could do the idea that I I showed versus the stone wall, but yeah, C four and G four typically aren't going to go together. You need the extra time by not having the C pawn push, so this is typically going to be a queen pawn idea. I probably play E six. I play D six. Okay. Yeah, e6 isn't the worst in the world, but I mean, the best way to try to refute a gambit is capturing. So we'll go from there and say I play h3. And this is like opposite side of the board, like Binko Gambit. Pushing slows, slows white down dramatically in the position. So then you get more of a game. And that's really all you need to know here. And then the rest of it's simple development. No, okay, we get a game. A similar cousin to this is queen d3 immediately. And it's another move that you're like, okay, well, he's just bothering my pawn. I guess I'm going to go e6. Well, then they go g4. And it is the same plan. So if you understand how the g-pawn is met, it's not scary. It's a simple idea. You shut down play, and you just get a game. But if you go into the dirty, dirty with it, like, uh, I remember the first time I saw this, it really made an impression. And it was at a tournament that I was at probably almost 10 years ago now. I am David Ross was playing a game in the first round against, like, some 1,800 player. And it's like a game in 30 or game in 45, like, fast time control tournament. And I saw him go queen d3 and g4, and I'm like, Check out this dude. Because I'd never seen it before, and then I looked into the ideas, and I was impressed by it. And I'll throw it out there every now and then. If I think my opponent isn't a theoretical type person that studied their opening, they just learned it, or I know they just started playing it recently, I'll throw out one of these sidelines that it's based off an aggressive idea. Does it hurt? Okay. So that pretty much does it for an overview of some... Stonewall Dutch ideas for the black side, and then Dutch ideas, aggressive ideas from the white side. So just hitting on the memory markers. Wanted to touch on some ideas within the opening, and uh, we're doing some kind of King Pond one for the next one. I'm not sure yet.